Welcome to Baby on the Brain, The Returners, a podcast brought to you by Stylist Magazine, dedicated to the big life questions you face when you're a new parent navigating motherhood and the return to work. My name is Fliss, I'm the Digital Content Director at Stylist, and I'm nine months into my return to work after 10 months of maternity leave. Every week I'm joined by a different co-host, and today I'd like to introduce Stylist's Editor-in-Chief, Lisa Smazarski. Lisa is not only an award-winning editor, but a mother of three, too. For this special bonus episode, we've teamed up with the international charity WaterAid to talk about the essentials every new mum should have, discussing what's helped others mentally and physically through birth and those early life stages of motherhood. Lisa. Hello. Hi. We've spoken about a lot in our time together. It's an unusual relationship. It is. is. I don't know how much we've really spoken about birth, because Mm. when I was pregnant and bouncing on my ball at home, it was locked down. Mm. And um, I was petrified. And there were various things going on with me that meant I was Googling everything. Mm. But I do want to talk to you about birth today, because I'm an over-preparer. And... So I watched every YouTube video. I knew by about 32 weeks that I wanted an elective C-section. I really pushed myself in that direction. What happened with you? What was your experience of birth like? Maybe the first time compared to the third time. Yes, yes. Um, Well, I I want to start by saying I probably didn't speak about birth because I hate all the people that tell you birth is awful all the time yeah. when you're pregnant because you've got no choice. You're, <laughs> towards it. you're already there. It's going to it's happen. It's going to have to come yeah. out somehow. So uh, I, I'm a bit... So my first story is not the nicest story, but the third story is great. So that's what I just want to have in mind. Um, so I guess for my first child, I went to NCT. I did all the prep, as most people do. I wrote a very sketchy birth plan, and I say sketchy because most of my friends who'd had children told me it was probably not going to happen like that. (laughs) So I worked really hard, unlike you, on not having this preconceived idea of what was going to happen, to be open to any eventuality. And actually, if I'm being really honest, just really focusing on both of us being healthy. Um, That's nice. Yes, exactly. Um, So I did have a birth plan, and I am laughing because when I went into labour, I had norovirus, and that was not in my birth plan. (laughs) So I I basically had been vomiting and, um, you know, everything for the the 24 hours before. And had you got to 40 weeks? I was 39 weeks. So So yeah, I was fine. So I was in the zone. I was waiting to go into labour. But um, my husband had it, and he was about six hours ahead of me. So I sort of watched him, God, you're real, (laughs) it's all about you. And then I got ill as well. And he'd started to feel better, put match of the day on. So it's night time. And I said to him, oh, when did the stomach cramps stop? And he was like, no, no, I haven't had any stomach cramps. And we were like, I'm in labor, but I hadn't noticed. So it was a bad start. I was pretty exhausted and pretty drained. Um, and I, I must admit, because of that, I was, just, I was just delirious when I went in. I felt awful. I bet. So all of this idea that you can go in feeling really healthy and really great, really strong, <laughs> wasn't my situation. With your little packed suitcase. So here's the thing. So this is what <laughs> makes me laugh about the whole thing. So this this idea of what you want, and they said like, take music, take lighting, take you know candles. I'll, I'll that all was these in my things. NCT class. Take a candle. It's going to be gorgeous. Yes. right? What are the things that you want to remember? Now, my ever-rising memory is Rich running around, me in the street, crouched down by the car, <laughs> him going back for pillows, literally coming out with an Ikea bag full of stuff, and I was livid. livid. <laughs> oh my I just God. want to get to the hospital. This is awful. Put the lamp down. Put the lamp down. So but they said lighting. <laughs> Bring the lighting. And then because um, I'd had uh, some issues that had been flagged, I couldn't go into the birth centre, so I went into the labour ward. And I was only something like three centimetres dilated, so I was in for the long haul. Oh. Very long story short. Took a long time. Um, I was struggling to deliver. And they basically had got to the point where we were about to intervene unless you dig deep, lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I'm and I tried to have, I tried to take um, meds and they, they hadn't given me any gas and air and still to this day, I don't know why, but... I had asked to have pain relief at various points. 
and it just wasn't working. It just didn't really work. So I was sort of half Ooh. sedated, half, mm. you know, not. Um, and yeah, eventually I was lucky enough to have a natural birth without intervention because I was like, I don't want the forceps and I don't want all the other interventions yeah. that are now being put literally, quite literally on the table mm. next to me. Um, but unfortunately, after I gave birth, the, uh, the placenta wouldn't come out. Mm. So I had to have, say, hour and a half later, a manual placental removal, oh. which, let me tell you, it's not a delightful experience. No. It involves being, uh, giving a spinal block, mm. which I was like, oh, no, oh, now I get it, oh, yeah. Gosh. Then literally being turned upside down and someone goes in with both hands and removes <laughs> the placenta, which after 12 hours of labor, wasn't much fun. You had two more kids after that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I did lose a lot of blood. So I was on oh, a, a no. lot, so it was, you know, and I did reflect at the time that had I lived somewhere where I didn't have that level of mm. medical intervention, there's a possibility I wouldn't have made it because I'd lost enough blood, the placenta were removed. So it was, a, it was not a fun experience. Mm. Um, I felt quite traumatized and battered and bruised after that. But, you know, as they always say, it melds away somewhere in the mind. <laughs> and I did have two more kids, but my um, second child, my son, came within four hours and came out like a dream. <laughs> and to the point where I was so, I was like, last time I took ages, I'd be really casual. And then suddenly things oh God, progressed really rapidly. In the street again, I was in the car bridge. park in the hospital, a bit like, oh my God, I'm not gonna make it. Got in and because I'm terribly British, I, didn't want to make a fuss. So I, sat, I was <laughs> having contractions, just like, because mm, it's very quiet. It's a bit awkward. I'm in a waiting room. So no one believed I was in labor. And then they went to give me uh, an inspection. Waters exploded everywhere. And then I was in a wheelchair as he started to ground. <laughs> so it was a lot of running. I felt like it's in peep show, some kind of dramatic being uh, oh. taken down the corridor. And then my, my third child was even faster than that. But they came out like a dream because it was like two or three pushes and there you go. But another manual placental removal. So oh, really? again, something that yeah. obviously just didn't work for me in the same way. But again, I was like those last two experiences, I only had gas and air. Mm. I was uh, euphoric afterwards. I was like, I could do that again right now. <laughs> Beauty of the drugs. Yeah, so I would say. 48 hours later, you're yeah, exactly. Not so really thing. different experiences, you know, very, yeah. very different experiences, and I just was incredibly grateful mm -hmm. to the medical team, to the NHS, because you, genuinely, particularly with my first child, that there would have been challenges. Gosh, and after the well, I suppose every birth. Who or what did you rely on? Because I remember... Massive sanitary towels. <laughs> <laughs> yes, amen yes. to that. And giant pants, which just haven't oh, made their way out so of my wardrobe lovely. yet. Yeah. <laughs> they are so comfortable. I'm never giving them up. Yeah. But I think for me, I, I was the second in my NCT group mm. to have the baby. The first was a real emergency and she was born at 32 weeks. Gosh, yeah. So she, Je baby Jess was in the NICU still mm. and I had Amber. And then everyone else was still... Yeah. Having a nice time, yeah, yeah. pottering around. And so I kind of was on forums at 3 a.m. Like, I don't mm. know who else to talk to about mm. this. So that's that was my comfort blanket for the first couple of weeks. What did you rely on? Yeah, I had, a, well, I would say the NCT group. I was the second of the eight of us. And then um, one of the, the other NCT women had her baby very quickly afterwards. And we sort of buddied up so we yeah. spent the whole time neurotically driving each other <laughs> but also it was a non-competitive it was very supportive it was a lovely group of women actually I have to say um and my partner was brilliant you know but it wasn't the same these were people who were going through exactly what I was going yeah. through I found breastfeeding really hard so mm. again having that support around me was really useful so I, all of my memories of that time are pretty much with them Lots of cups of tea, lots of tears, lots of tears, really honest, mm. people really sharing. And actually, that was enough for me to go, oh, do you know what? It's not just me finding this really yeah. hard, which is all I really needed, actually. Because I had, I had bad baby blues straight after my first child, particularly, which I'm not particularly a crier. And 
they would just fall out mm. of but the tears would fall out of my face that like hot flooding tears and I found that really hard because I just felt so not like me um <clears throat> and it passed quite quickly luckily but Again, seeing someone else having the same reaction was yeah. really reassuring. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron and, dubbed that the daily cry yeah. for me. That's he was funny, like, isn't it? And one day he was like, Bliss, you know you've been three days without your daily cry. Did it make you cry? It made me want to hurt him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how dare you count this? But yeah, I was like, oh, okay, that's something that's passing. Then. Yeah. But it is, the hormones are raging. It was very, I did not expect very that. Tra- there's a lot of things physically that I didn't expect mm. actually during that time. Um, your body is just not your own. It's not something you've yeah. just got used to it being pregnant. And then suddenly there's a whole other stage that's less talked about, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that, you know, you're losing blood for a quite a long yeah. time. Um, obviously your milk coming in is incredibly painful, you mm. know, so there's a whole, and I did have friends with children. I was probably in a slightly different situation where I was lucky enough to have a few people who were a few years ahead of me. So I did lean on them as well. Um, but yeah, that, that was a real shock to me and the hormones with it, which, you know, the crying stopped, but there were many other <laughs> things <laughs> that were not preach. Let's not say stable. <laughs> It feels like a really good time for us to bring in our guests yes, for today's let's do episode. It. And today we're joined by Shakira Akabusi, a mum of four, women's fitness trainer and founder of Strong Like Mum, a movement offering advice and support to women about keeping active during and after pregnancy. And Dr. Amalina Bakri, a doctor and surgeon and clinical research fellow at Imperial College London. She's also the co-founder of Girls for Girls UK, encouraging girls to become leaders. And she had her first baby just four months ago. A collective congratulations yes, from congratulations. all of us on that. <laughs> and thank you so much both for joining thank today. You. I want to start at the deep end. Shakira, as a mum of four, can you tell us a little bit about the different births you might have had? Yeah, so mine were all very different as well. So three, three births, four children. Um, and, and I think kind of the reverse of you, Lisa, like my first birth, was you know picture perfect oh, as you, you know I, I arrived at the hospital and I was adamant adamant that I wanted to have an epidural and everyone was persuading <laughs> me like oh maybe you try that no and I had I had the doctor uh, my doctor my GP write on my labour notes my birth plan you must have epidural like bright red letters <laughs> did you force them take yeah. the pen so as soon as I got to hospital I was like See what it says. GP recommended, <laughs> um, and 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 it, it was great. Like I met the the um, the but then before that, I went into the bath. I was able to sit in water, which nice. was amazing. So you got into the birthing suite. I mean, I'm um, I didn't so get holy into, grail. I didn't get into the birthing suite. I just wow. had a bath in the. Oh, you did that right? Okay, fine. Uh, but it was amazing. Like the effect of water, and I've not had a water birth, but that was incredible. Just getting into that warm water mm. was great. And then I came out, was able to have my epidural, and my son was born, and you know, it, it was really a brilliant first experience. And then with my second, I had, um, I struggled with anxiety throughout my first two pregnancies and postnatally, really quite extreme anxiety um, and OCD. And in my second delivery, I was, in my second pregnancy, I was classed as low risk because I'd had, you know, a, a relatively complication free first pregnancy and delivery. And for me, that actually fueled my anxiety more because mm. all of a sudden I was like, what if something happens and they're not expecting it to happen or I don't have this. Mm. Um, so I had all these other concerns and anxieties. And it was, again, a really positive birthing experience, but I didn't, I didn't have access to the water initially, which made a big difference. And the epidural, I think, again, similar to you, these like half, half worked, mm. half didn't work. So I had this kind of... You know, where I, I was told I had a long body, and that was <laughs> oh, maybe it's us awesome with a long body. Yes, long yeah. body <laughs> um, maybe yeah. So that that was that was slightly more challenging, but again, a very quick. De- eventually, when he was born, very quick delivery. Um, and then with my twins, I was scheduled for my first cesarean section, and I haven't I hadn't had a cesarean before. I'd worked with cesarean women a lot, mm. um, and the actual process of a cesarean birth was very peaceful mine was um yeah. elected yeah. so it wasn't an emergency cesarean it was very peaceful it was very calm I, I felt really supported in that environment 
um, the recovery from a cesarean it was a shock to the system. I, and I remember saying to my husband, you know, for the first time in my life, I felt alien in my own skin. I've always been so in tune with my body and what it needs and how it feels. And I felt a complete disconnect. I couldn't, it was so difficult. And I remember standing there. Um, so I had my twins during the lockdown, during COVID. And um, it, it hugely understaffed as the NHS was just under so much pressure mm. um, there wasn't as much support in that postnatal recovery and I remember a midwife getting really angry at me because I'd rung the button this was the first day I'd had the twins and I'd rung the button because I had one of them and I asked her can you pass me the other twin and she got really angry and being like we we don't have time to come in here every time you need to feed your baby so this is something you're gonna have to be able to figure that out we have mums who can just handle it so I was like okay so I was really scared about ringing yeah. the buzzer and it was the middle of that night that first night they'd born, been born at midday it was about two o'clock in the morning and I needed to change my maternity underwear yeah and I was in the bathroom and I was like I can't bend down and I can't lift my knee up yeah and I was on my own because we weren't mad, allowed visitors. It? Yeah. yeah, it was really difficult. And so I just stood there crying. Like, I don't know what to do. And I've, I've never not been able to move my yeah. body like that. I remember the midwife coming to get me. It was 1.30 in the morning. And she said, you need to stand up now. Yeah. You've got to stand up and walk. And I was like, I don't, what? I've only yeah, just yeah. regained feeling in my toes. Yeah, yeah. And she kind of pivoted me around. She went, come on. And she held both my hands. And I remember taking these baby steps thinking... I actually, I, this is like forgetting how to walk. Yeah. I can't, what, are you joking? Mm -hmm. Anyway, an hour later, they were making me push the baby to the shower and back, you know. it was. Wow. They do just get you up and going, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they do, and I know that they need to. There are yeah, medical reasons to, yeah. to get you up on yeah. your feet. But I just hadn't anticipated how difficult that will mm. be, and the recovery really was um, a real journey, almost a journey of self-discovery, because mm. I had to get to know my body again in this new way and, and you're doing that with two again. babies and two yeah. older children yeah. as well so yeah. it's quite physical time yeah exactly mm. exactly so it was it was a very and largely on my own at that point mm. because I, you were allowed visitors for two hours a day That's so the rest of the time yeah you know you're on your own so it was it was um a challenging in a different yeah. way you've, you've made me remember that I because I wasn't very experienced around babies either and I genuinely didn't know when to change a nappy or how often to do it so I called the midwife in the middle of the night and she was livid <laughs> <laughs> so, is this been number one should I change, I'm assuming should I change this baby's nappy she was like what I was like I don't know what I'm doing with my first <laughs> yeah. I remember the next morning he was born at 7 p.m and then my husband left at I think it was midnight because it was New Year's Eve so it was fireworks I remember oh. watching the fireworks and then my husband left and then from midnight to 8 p.m I was like it's great he's sleeping like everyone's always told me the babies wake up he was asleep and so they came in at eight o'clock in the morning and they were like so how was the night how was the feeding I was like whoa he's been asleep and they were like red yeah. alert they're like you haven't got your baby up and, and I was like I didn't know all you ever hear is don't wake a sleeping baby and I was like I've got a really good sleeper over here and they were like no 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 you need to get him up and feed him so again like, I just did I didn't know I had quite a similar experience actually. so in those first few days weeks what was really essential to you? Um, I think I think you've touched on it a little bit there. Like other women, mm. for me, were really really key. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about my first experience. As I said, I had really extreme anxiety and OCD, and women who were going through it at a similar time um, was really important because even my mum, who was incredibly helpful although not during the delivery. She wanted to be my birth partner, and she was like, I'm going to be... And my husband was there, but that time I was allowed three people, so my mum, my husband, and my sister were all there. And my mum was like, I'm going to... And she, like, fainted on the side <laughs> of the table. So I was like, you are absolutely <laughs> useless. Job. I on. know, exactly. So, um, but so she... she you were like, worrying about your mum. I know, I was like, is she OK? Um, so, she, anyway, she was, she, was re she was really present and, you know, really helpful, but... Just that big generational shift of, you know, how you parent. Mm. Like, oh, no, I wouldn't be a baby like that. But we didn't do that in my day. We would do that, you know, and all mm. of that. Yeah. So speaking to women who were going through it at the same time was really, really key for me. Um, and then I, you know, I'm also, I'm not afraid to ask for help. So I would absolutely pester my GP, pester my midwife, 
you know, pester my neighbour who is also a GP, <laughs> ask them any questions that I had. You know, I was really insistent on getting that knowledge of anything that I was worried about. Mm. Amelina, yes. is it too soon for me to ask <laughs> <laughs> how it went and how you yeah. prepared? Yeah. So as a doctor, <laughs> I thought that I would, you know, be able to, I mean, I understand the physiology of childbirth, um, but it's a completely different experience as a patient. You know, I, I delivered babies previously when I was a junior, very young junior doctor, but on when you're on the other side, it's very, very challenging. And, you know, I had my birth plan, everything all sorted. Um, you know, I even prepared my hostel bag, like when I was 32 weeks, because I was worried that, I was very anxious. I was worried that I was gonna go into labor early. I guess you've um, seen the worst. Oh yes, I, I, I've that, seen, I've yeah, seen yeah, yeah. the worst that could yeah, happen because so. I was working at labor ward previously when I was doing my rotations as a first mm. year junior doctor. So having seen all of that, so I was trying to prepare myself mm. to the worst case scenario. So um, yeah, it was it was very very. I was very anxious. I was trying to plan everything out, um, and you know, talking through with my husband, and we also joined the NCT class as well. So mainly because we wanted to get to know other mums yeah. in the areas. Um, so then I could go for a walk. So now we've got a couple of um, other mums um, who I would normally go for a walk together and do activities together um, now. So which is great. But anyway, so back to preparation. So. I thought I knew everything, um, so I even prepared, um, you know, made a, a, an Excel spreadsheet of like what I need to do, I love that. what I need to bring to to the to the hospital. Um, when the time came, though, <laughs> everything was just like all over the place. <laughs> um, I was in labour for about almost two days. Um, so when I arrived in the hospital, um, I was about four centimetres dilated. Um, so I had an epidural, so I managed to have that. Um, so that was in my birth plan. I had gas in it as well. Um, and then by the time when I got the epidural in, so I was quite rested and, and I managed to sleep because it was quite a long labour mm. in the first instance because it, it started around 10 in the evening, the day before, and I was throughout the whole day of Saturday and I gave birth on the early hours of sa Sunday. So so it was it was very, very tiring obviously and I was eating lots of snacks and having you know energy drinks as well um, to help me to go through the labor and uh, so my husband prepared a labor playlist for me although we didn't really use it because I was so tired so I just wanted to sleep so we just you know slept throughout um, you know during, on the second day and we also had aromatherapy as well um, massage oil um, but didn't use any yeah, of those this things. Is, this is what so, the idea yeah. had. <laughs> like, you know, just trying to be prepared, but you don't really use it. Um, but it was nice to have my husband around. I mean, I think it was really difficult oh, for God, you yeah. to go through labour when, especially during COVID, where you didn't really have a partner to come with you. But I was lucky to have my, 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 my husband uh, there with me. And um, so now, um, she's four months old. Her name's Arabella. Um, I think in terms of the postnatal side of it, um, I would say there are ups and downs. Um, you know, there are days where I feel like I can't really do anything because, I mean, obviously she's still very young and she needs me. So there are days where I feel that I have to just cuddle her and just breastfeed her and just sit on the sofa and just chill. But there are days where I feel that like I'm a super mom that I just, you know, you can just do anything in the world. Like I would just go out for a walk with a friend um, or go for a coffee or do some activities, lessons. Um, we went to um, Natural History Museum yesterday for a sensory class. So that was really, really fun. And in the afternoon, I tried to do some work for my PhD as well because I'm trying to write up. <laughs> I'm like, Whoa. I'm dry. <laughs> I just remember I'm dribbling on the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to write up my thesis at the same time because I feel some, I'm on my maternity leave at the moment, but I'm going back to work uh, in August. So I just feel that I need um, to submit submit my thesis to before yeah, yeah. before I go back to work because then I know that I'll you know have enough time to to do that when I'm on full time job as a doctor and it'll be really difficult. So mm -hmm. I might as well just try to get it done before I go back to full time job. So I try to do my best and and have like a, a nanny to come in um, like once a, a week so that I can do my admin work and PhD work. But it's still very, very difficult mm. and there are still ups and downs. And um, 
the first few weeks uh, were very, very challenging for me because of breastfeeding, especially. Because, mm. um, I mean, I, I learned, you know, how to breastfeed. Mm. But when you, you know, when, when the time for you to breastfeed, it was, it was so difficult because first, Arabella wasn't latching well. Mm. Um, so we had to get advice from the midwives and also the lactation consultant. We also went to see a, a Tang Thai specialist as well because she was having difficulties with latching. So she had an assessment. Um, she was a bit borderline, so we decided not to um, cut the, the, uh, the frontal and the, the tongue. But um, she didn't improve. Um, mm. So then I managed to breastfeed afterwards um, after maybe three or four weeks of like pumping and also oh, that sounds very yeah, yeah actually. lots of lots of pumping yeah. and on and you know top up with formula as well it's very so. hard isn't it because you just yeah. feel like like you say you've, you've done your homework you think yeah. you should be able to do it and you feel a bit like you're failing yeah somehow yeah. Yeah. even though there's two of you involved yeah. right yeah. it's not just a, an automatic <laughs> like it's just yeah. gonna work exactly very and I was, I was i was very emotional at the time because yeah. mm. i thought i wanted to breastfeed yeah. and i couldn't do it and you know people don't really talk about how difficult breastfeeding is. Mm. I don't know. I mean, when I spoke to my friends or you know other people, or, or even on social media or on the TV, on the media, uh, people don't really talk about breastfeeding much. I don't think. And so I thought it would be a smooth journey. Uh, it would be like, yeah, I, I learned how to do it. I'm a doctor. I know what to do. Mm. But no, it's it's mm. it's not. It's not. You know, real real reality is not. I'm, it's not. The same. I mean, I, I'm nodding so much because it's just so familiar to me that mm. when I would feed my son. I would get this electric shock pain down to my elbow, like oh. a, and I just persevered because yeah. I thought, well, it's probably me. It's just I'm getting on with it. Like I put mm. up with a lot before I went to a lactation yeah. as a consultant, and still I found it hard afterwards. But I, d I beat myself up a lot. I really regret that. Mm. I really, and you know, I learned from that in future. But I really wish I was waiting for someone to give me permission to to yeah. maybe move on or to find a different way, mm. pumping more or whatever. But I did, I struggled with that. I didn't, yeah. I beat myself up. Yeah. I found, I mean, oh sorry, I, I found breastfeeding, the thing with breastfeeding that I didn't uh, expect was the emotional yes. mm. challenges. Like mm. I, physically, I had, I was far, you know, my, uh, my son and I, you know, managed to figure that out and he had a really good latch and that was all After fine. a nice eight hour sleep. After a nice eight <laughs> hours sleep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, that, that side of it was okay. It, for me, it was the, the mental side of breastfeeding that mm. I really struggled with. Mm. And it, I remember writing a piece called Bullied into Breastfeeding because I, I almost felt like bullied by my baby, bullied by myself, bullied by other people, like forced to do this thing. And the mm. second the baby goes, nah, they're like, and like oh, that, that annoying, like, click anytime I hear that <laughs> yeah. at the top, it's just like, Pfft. and it was really, you know, I really, really, really struggled. And I think it was because I just wasn't prepared. People had talked about latching on and how you do that and nose to nipple and all of that. And so I, had, oh, I got God. that. Yeah. But I just right. was not yeah. prepared for how overwhelming it, it can be. And I really struggled. And then when I had my twins, I breastfed two babies and it was a much more positive experience. Yeah. Be mm. Just wow. because, you know, which I didn't just expect. I was just prepared. much prepared. Yeah, much yeah. more prepared. Also because you're tired as well. I mean, it's just yeah. constant, isn't it? I mean, as a doctor, I'm on call you know, for 12 hour, 13 hour shift. But I feel like I'm being constantly on call the whole time. Mm. Like your baby needs you and yeah. crying. Like, oh, I need to go now. I need to feed now. Or they just want you, they just need a cuddle. So it's just basically non-stop. Mm. And it's just a completely big change. It's quite from, shocking, isn't it? It is, isn't it? yeah. It and is that is the shocking. fatigue, isn't it? I mean, no, not that I want to freak you out, but you've only just started to get <laughs> full night's sleep. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, Amber's 20 months. Yeah. And last week she slept through the night for the first time. <gasps> Amazing. Mm. Which is wild. You are doing so well, by the way. Oh I'm my god! Yeah. I mean, she's doing a thesis. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, my brain did a well. I am in the house in my slippers once, <laughs> and they're not like you can't Believe mistake me. them for shoes. It, <laughs> it is difficult. And um, when I wanted to try to write up when when we didn't have a babysitter coming in, I would uh, use a, a carrier, a baby carrier. Mm. So that's how normally she would you know, fall asleep on me on a baby carrier. So that's probably the the last resort that I would use if she does doesn't want to sleep if she she doesn't want to do anything she just wants to cry and I just carry her around and just able to do lots of different things even cooking and like it's very impressive you know, I feel yeah. an affinity great. towards her I'd love someone to just carry me around <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds yeah. really great yeah I'm not doing that <laughs> um, I do think it's a good time for us to reflect on why we're here today and 
what we might take for granted because we've all been talking about some really wonderful parts of the NHS that we've all used Mm -hmm. and what we take for granted having babies in the UK but simple essential facilities such as clean water to drink and wash with a decent toilet being able to shower after birth aren't always guaranteed for women around the world and I have some stats here Scarily, every two seconds a woman gives birth at a health centre without clean water, which means no decent toilets, no good hygiene. One in four healthcare centres around the world have no clean water on site. Um, And almost half of healthcare centres have no basic hand washing facilities. And when I think back, I had an elective caesarean um, um, like you did. And when I think back about all the processes that were put in place, you know, Aaron and I were in gowns and actually it was during COVID as well. So we had like extra hand washing to do and and all the people that were in specialist gloves and masks and all the equipment, Mm. I can't imagine not being able to wash your hands. No, I I mean, mean, this is just so beyond me. And I I thought about this a lot when I first discovered these statistics, because I'll go back to the birth that I was sharing with you. I was head to toe covered in blood, like really head to toe covered in blood. It was everywhere. Um, I had somebody else's hands inside me for quite a significant Mm. amount of time. Um, You know, there are things that would have put both of us at huge risk during that birth, of not having access to that. But really also just the humanity of being able to have a shower afterwards. I I can remember, I mean, my oldest is 12 years old. I can remember in great detail that first shower (laughs) I had. And I was in flip-flops, because that's what I've been advised to do, yeah. in the uh, <laughs> in hospital IKEA shower. Yeah. But there were two things. There was a cup of tea and that shower, mm. and they were the things that made me breathe and start to come out of that whole process. And it's so simple, like so unbelievably simple, but it, it made all the difference. And I just, you know, it, it's so distressing to think that people Both don't have access. Both of those things access. need clean water. Yeah, clean water for a cup of tea. Yeah clean water for a shower you know and it's and that's you know we're talking about luxuries yeah yeah. at the end of that being able to use well sanitized toilets and Mm. you know you you shared your story about going into the bathroom we're all doing these things that actually if you haven't got access to Mm. water is just so beyond comprehension Mm. actually and you know the realize the privilege that we have but yeah and i think obviously just you know if you think about maternal mortality um, of course, but the baby's health as well. You know, there are so many factors playing into why we need good sanitation around mm. giving birth. But yeah, it, it's really hard. And you think, you know, when we're talking about just basic stuff here, uh, there should be a right for everyone. Yeah, it absolutely should. I, obviously, in your healthcare professional role as well, yeah. not having clean water, that would be have a huge impact on how you work yes absolutely I, I can't imagine you know how I would be able to work without clean water because we do have to clean our hands before we see patients and clean instruments as well you know before surgery for example if you have a c-section and you don't have clean instruments mm. um you know to do of course you know all the cutting and everything so it, it is going to cost cross-contamination and infections mm. um, so it's going to be really really difficult and you know increase mortality rate and also uh, morbidity rate as well so it is you know I can't imagine you know myself not having clean water when I'm at work to be mm. honest I feel very lucky to be able to do that here in the NHS uh, in, in yeah. the UK and Shakira your your amazing bath that you were yeah. dunking around yeah, in. absolutely can um, you imagine I, no exactly absolutely and also I um I think a lot about that first sort of that initial postpartum period, going to the toilet. If I was going to the to the loo and I was changing, let's say a pad, you know, with the the locking, mm. this heavy bleeding that you can have after after delivery, and then I'd wash my hands and I'd go and pick up my baby, mm. and the thought of having a fear of picking up my baby for a fear of spreading infection yeah. or that, you know, that also really resonates with me because we all you know want to protect our children mm. and. The idea that some women would have that fear about even being in contact with their baby, that, mm. you know, uh, my my kind of first experience of that type of situation was when I was a child, I was about eight, and we'd gone to Nigeria to visit family, and my granddad had, we were still in Lagos, in the, in the capital, and my granddad had had a car accident, and he'd been on his way to visit us, so he was in Lagos, but he's actually from a village in East Nigeria, and so we'd gone to this hospital to go and visit him, and it... it 
it it basically was like you know when you park in a car park in London, you go down like the back stairs, mm. <clears throat> um, and it smells like urine a little bit, and you know, and that is exactly what it was like. It was like a concrete block. It was filthy. There was urine down the stairs, and they took us to this, <clears throat> and they took us to this room where he was to have his operation. And I, my dad, at the, you know, at that time, we acted really quickly and we managed to get him out of there and we had to drive him to another hospital in the boot of a car. But wow. that was my first experience of a hospital for some people, yeah, which, the, the uh, you know, i would always been t- to my doctor as a kid, like, oh, it's you and you get a sticker and a lollipop. <laughs> and this was the, someone's reality. Yeah. Um, and to think that women are birthing their children there where you're at, in such an incredibly vulnerable position, yeah. Yeah. you know, and... And physically, like you said, you know, the hygiene aspect, it's just, it, 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 we've all said blows, blows our mind, but it, at the fact that right now someone is living that as their reality is mm. something I can't fully comprehend. I remember that I did a volunteering work. This is when I was a medical student um, many years ago. Um, I went to Tanzania and I was working in this very small hospital in a village, um, somewhere in a rural area uh, in Tanzania. And... They didn't have clean water there, and they had to walk for about miles and miles just to get clean water uh, in this in sort of a town area. And um, so, so obviously, when they wanted to clean the instruments, just putting everything in a bucket, um, and it wasn't even clean water. Um, and so, they don't really have proper sterilization system, and um, they had to reuse all the um, you know, bedding, linens, um, even surgical um, uh, wear that, 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 that people that doctors wear. Um, so that means that there was an increased risk of HIV transmission um, between different patients and different, um, mm. um, you know, mum and mother as well. So, so it, it was quite, you know, quite a, a very sad experience for me to to, to see that. Um, but it was it was just yeah, um, very, um, you know, it makes me me sad and and, and cry. Um, so I was there for about a month and was just travelling around and go to different hospitals in Tanzania. And all have sort of similar sort of facilities. Um, but then after that, um, a group of um, doctors from the UK, Germany, I think the US as well, came to, to visit and we all went to help. And um, and then there was a, a bit of a uh, donation going around and managed to help with the, um, you know, helping out with uh, providing the, um, you know, clean water for the hospitals around the area. So so that was a good experience for me as well. But. Yeah. Like, like you mentioned, you just can't imagine having, not having clean water to, to do everything that you need to do from a medical perspective as mm-hmm. well as um, for the patients as well. I mean, even going in with norovirus. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. that's it. Was something you think that you could have spread to, to everyone. everyone. Yeah. Absolutely mm-hmm. everyone. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the newborn baby. And being tucked off to a corner, given yeah. that privacy, given, and obviously the, the, the health benefits that everyone of that, mm-hmm. um, the sanitation of the team, being able to clean between seeing me and another patient yeah. you know you just think obviously how dangerous that must be to a newborn as well yeah. um so yeah I, I i think that this is why we felt so strongly about working with water aid Absolutely. wasn't it yeah uh, and i think we all agree that no midwife should have to deliver babies without clean water and no mother should have to give birth without mm. access to clean water for at the bare minimum to have a shower afterwards mm. um Water Aid's appeal, Water Means Life, aims to raise funds and awareness to bring clean water, decent toilets and good hygiene facilities to healthcare centres in Mozambique and around the world. So this is why we are supporting Water Aid. This is it. This is our special episode. It is. Where we do this. Mm -hmm. We are going to move on a bit now. So we just want to get into um, more of the detail about what you wish you'd been told before you went into motherhood. Now... I'm going to start with you because obviously you have so much knowledge, too much knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> too much knowledge about what was going to happen. But I guess more, not necessarily just the birth, but motherhood itself. Yeah. Is there anything? Well, I wouldn't say I have too much knowledge because I'm not an obstetrician, so that's not my specialty. But I sort Trust of Trust me, you've learned, done more than the average I learned woman. that at university. I've <laughs> uh, done a few sort of, you know, rotations in obstetrics, so yeah. kind of had a little bit of experience. But um I would say breastfeeding, probably, yeah. um, because I thought that I've got this, you know, because I I learned I I learned this in medical school, um, you know, 
I just have to pop the baby baby into my boobs and that's it. You just have to mm. feed. But no, it was really, really, really hard. And my nipples bled uh, multiple yeah. times. Um, the first few weeks I was crying and crying because I wanted mm. to breastfeed her. And, and I thought I was a failed mother. Mm. Um, and, but then you know, she was losing weight at the time. Um, especially I think the first couple of weeks um, she was losing more than she was supposed to lose mm. and the midwife came to visit us um, in our house and said you know I think you probably need to pump and uh, top up the formula and don't worry about it don't worry that you can't breastfeed I know you want to breastfeed that's what I really want to do but you just have to um, think about her that she needs to to be able to feed mm. so that's most importantly is to just get her feed you know get her fed um, so then, yeah, so, so I did all of that. I was pumping rigorously for you know, every two to three hours. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, no one no. tells you that's going to be your reality, <laughs> no, do they? No, it's, it, was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was so consuming. difficult. Did yeah. you at least have an electric pump? Because the one that's oh, yeah, like a yeah. I used the Medela. That really gets you happy. <laughs> I, I, I used, I used the Medela breast pump, or the double one. So it, yeah. was, it was quite easy to use, yeah. And my, my husband was helping a lot as well with everything. So he's, mm. he's such a... Which is a privilege mm -hmm. as well, actually, yeah. isn't yeah. it? To have someone, yeah, yeah. Partner I think there, breastfeeding yeah. is the most difficult, and also being a first time mum, yeah. Yeah. I wish someone would be able to come in and just like teach me what do I need to do like mm. first day, second day. Yeah, it'd be great week. if that was part of the natural rite of passage yeah. You know, yeah. after having a child that you almost spent time with a yeah. lactation consultant. Because you do that session, if you do NCT, you do that session and you're like, this is so hypothetical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The baby and the doll are very different. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. One's moving. Yeah. <laughs> what about for yourself? What's the, the one thing you wish I'd known? Home? Do you know, I'm... Um, for me, I, I, I said earlier, you know, I struggled a lot with anxiety and OCD. Yeah. And it was extreme. Like, and did you share that with the medical team that were looking after you? Or was that I something actually, you were just... I actually did. I actually did. Um, and I had to fill out a questionnaire. And they basically said, well, you haven't scored high enough. And they were like, to be honest, unless, sorry, this is terrible. Unless oh. you are suicidal, it's not oh. something that we can, wow. you know, help mm. you with you can try yeah, this sort shocking. of online platform and I would just have too much going on in my head to, to, to go down that route and it got so extreme it was taking me about four and a half hours to get to bed every day so I had this tapping and counting that I constantly right. felt yeah. I had to do throughout my pregnancies and if it's not to personal to us did you have OCD before is that something that I had OCD as a child right. and I went through a period of time where I certainly can't remember relying on it yeah um but it became really prevalent mm. yeah. during like my parenting experience yeah. and account pregnancy as part of that. I was working in, you know, just to give another example, I was working in Brick Lane. I had to walk from Brick Lane to Liverpool Street, which is about seven minutes. And it took me three and a half hours and I finished work at 8 p.m. And I didn't end up getting the train until midnight from Waterloo because I had to do so much. Stop, turn around, go back to... Mm. It, I was completely unrecognised. That's you know, crippling. It, it's mm. completely mm. all-consuming. Mm. Um, and I feel like, as you can see, I now don't do OCD at, at all mm. anymore. Um, and at the time I felt like I was keeping everybody safe, but, but my point, sorry to answer your question. I think what I wish I had known is that when you're a mum, mm. you're so often told, just trust your instincts. You're the mum, yeah. you'll know what to do. You know, if I, if my child's sick, which they is literally huge, say, that is literally said to you all, yeah. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and like, if I take my child somewhere because they're ill, um, they would say, oh, you know, they're okay, I think they're fine, but you're the mum, so you know. So if you feel like something, trust your instincts. And you just you're like, I feel like that for four hours. Exactly, yeah. I'm, yeah. Like, I'm constantly yeah, like that. Yeah, I could, yeah. I, it, that I doesn't would be, help I'd me. Move in. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, that really doesn't help me. I had to learn how to differentiate between what was an anxiety thought and what was an instinct thought, because they can be so closely linked. Mm. And I, I learnt to do that eventually... Through, well, I, I initially I did talk therapy and hypnotherapy, but really it was like, it's about a mindfulness and being able to appreciate quiet and breathing. And I remember in my first, when I did this antenatal class as well, them talking you through breathing techniques for labour. And I was like, you have got to be joking me. I am not using breathing. Like, there's got to be some drunk. <laughs> like, no, but now... I use I breathing really in day-to-day -day life. That's exactly. <laughs> I was like, no, no. But now I understand the power of that. And, you know, now as a mum of four... I've got 
you know, someone's always asking me a question. Mama, 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 mama. Ah, someone's screaming, someone's falling over, they're having an argument. Blah, blah, blah. It's constant. Yeah. That breathing. That breathing, you've yeah, got to get into it. You don't it's often get the time. If I could, I would literally close the door for an hour, like, you know, lie down, have a sleep, wake up, and I'd be like, okay, I'm ready to go. You can't always have that, but what you can do is even if it is a minute, I take some deep breaths, and there's, you know, there's scientific reasons as to what happens in our body when we take deep breaths. Mm. Um, and hormonally how that can shift and help us kind of, but I wish I had understood that and also allowed myself that time. Mm. Like it was incredibly powerful and it literally set me free. I am now, you know, a mum of four children, more sickness and children, hectic, <laughs> crazy chaos. And I've never been so calm and in control of my anxiety. I'm not calm and in control, but of my anxiety, I am, you yeah. know. Um, and, and, and I wish I had had that the first time because I was in like a, a dark heart. I didn't think I could ever get better. I yeah. think it was, sorry, sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say, hypnobirthing that and it really helped me yeah. during my first stage of labor. Really, really did help yeah. me a lot, yeah. A lot of people do swear by it, actually, mm. Who, mm. who followed it. Um, I, I was just going to add to that, actually, because I think it's probably on the same thought, which is we talk about maternal, probably postnatal mental health more than we talk about actually during pregnancy. And I think obviously there are lots of issues and there's lots of times where people should be accessing help with which your story is one of those or have access to help. And I, I think it's just a really challenging area because it's so taboo to yeah. feel like that to not be enjoying it to not be um yeah. getting the most out of that experience but of course it's terrifying as well you know we've we've all talked about fear in different mm. ways yeah. so i think again just sharing that story is just so important and probably will help people who are in that I situation so. i mean i genuinely wish someone had told me that i would get through that and that i you know it would be okay mm. and that I didn't have to live my life like that. Cause I, I felt like I've now signed up to a life change forever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, literally. I mean, this the is fact it, I can you know, sit here and not yeah. do OCD. Is so much huge... hormonal impact as well. You know, so many yeah. different things happening to our bodies at that yeah. time. Um, Fliss, I'm going to ask you my next question first. Oh, that's just because you always <laughs> think you're getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then. But what's the best uh, piece of advice you were given either about birth or motherhood? Oh my gosh. I am not prepared for this kind of thing. <laughs> I think... Well, something I said, yeah? <laughs> yeah, this wonderful lady. No, you gave me lots... I think a lot of people said, um, and it's so cliche, so I apologise in advance, but this will pass. Mm -hmm. um, and the other phrase that is said so often that I wrote down, like, I hate this, but it is so true, is that the days are long, but the years are really I said short. That too. Yes, <laughs> I think it's just one of those things that you pass around when you hear At it. At the time you're like, that's when horrendous. When you're having a shit day, yeah. you're like, that is the worst thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> but suddenly you snap and they're nearly two. Mm, yeah. And I'm like, How but I'm just a young mum. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? My newborn baby. Yeah, what's what? going on? I'm yeah. 17, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not. And the years are fast. Yeah. And I think, like, it's a bit of what you said, actually. Knowing that even if you're having a rubbish day or you're having a moment where you feel like you can't cope, life carries on and mm. it still moves and this tiny little thing you have to look after now grows up so fast mm, mm. and before you know it they're sat on the floor saying no repeatedly <laughs> yeah. um, and so like they're tiny now enjoy those cuddles yes. like uh, when you were talking about having a baby fall asleep on you i thought oh, oh gosh that yeah. is so that lovely. might be the bit that gets me every time actually yeah she doesn't that do that stunning. anymore now oh. i mean oh. <laughs> she, used to, she used to sleep on my chest and i'll be like oh cuddling but then yeah. she doesn't that's it's the one about. thing like when they're under the weather where oh. they will sleep. Yeah, the snuggles. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. oh. I can get a 12 year old still on my chest. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm like, you just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amelina, what about you? The best piece of advice that you've been given? Um, I think just enjoy motherhood, I think. Um, not to think too much about it, not to be too well prepared, because I think I was trying too hard initially. Mm and trying to read about everything, trying to be too prepared about everything and <laughs> too organised, but actually it just doesn't really happen that way and it just happens <laughs> naturally. So you just have to like learn as you go along. And also having my mum to help around is also really useful. Mm -hmm. So my mum came to stay with us um, 
for a month after I gave birth. Yeah. Oh, so wow, that was good. very, very helpful um, to have her, you know, cleaning, cooking and um, making all the homemade Malaysian food. Um, she lives in Malaysia, so she came over to fly yeah. over to stay with us. So that was really, yeah. really, really helpful. And my obviously my husband has just been really great yeah. um, with everything, cooking, cleaning. And um, I, all I needed to do during the, like, the first, was we'll say, few months was just feeding the baby. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is good advice. And I think, yeah. I, I mean, we hear, again, a cliche, but it takes a village. It does. But yeah. actually, as someone who's terrible at asking for help, which I am because I want to prove I'm self-sufficient, <laughs> my mum also kindly came and she was like, I'll just do a night for you. Like, leave mm. milk for me, do these things. And I was like, I felt like a new woman mm. afterwards. And just those sort of moments. Yeah. That, Asking for help is mm-hmm. like an incredible thing. What about you, Shakira? Best bit of advice. Um, uh, well, I, I do agree with the, you know, this too shall pass and, and, and also your message about, um, you know, the days are, days are long, but the years are short. Absolutely. I think, I think I remember a quote that someone said to me that really resonated with me where they said, the little, th- the little, th- uh, the small things and the small moments aren't small. And that, mm. I, I remember that all the time because it's good it's so quick to like rush through things and it's all hectic and (laughs) and actually then like you know i'll be on the floor and they're building magnetics or we're in the garden we've done obstacles whatever it's like the littlest thing yeah and they're not little things those that's like that's the amazing thing thing. that is you know really is the things and um yeah so that and i try my best to like remember that because all too often I'll be with them and I'm thinking about something I need to do at work or you know Mm. and actually to just appreciate that this little thing right here this is the good stuff like we're healthy we're happy we're at home we're playing we're outside Mm. that is like huge it's actually huge so I think that I think you just enjoy every single moment because you never get the time back because Mm. and especially with Arabella you know she's four months now but just going through that milestones and watching her from like a little newborn baby and now she's um, able to roll she's now um, you know on her tummy and playing and smiling and giggling it's just that tiny little moments like you mentioned yeah you just have to treasure it and just Pretty enjoy precious. it yeah, yeah. yeah. They are precious. Not, not all so great but so <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> and actually, there is balance to that it's yeah. sometimes you're allowed to sit in a corner and it's not all right no exactly <laughs> sometimes yeah. I'm, I'm not especially when she's making all dinosaur noise as well <laughs> in the middle of the night at three in the morning when you're she wants like, to play Shh. I just oh. want to sleep Arabella please mm. <laughs> at least it's just dinosaur it's, noise. Not, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a very complex time isn't yeah. it I think but, but those early months of new motherhood and they're extreme highs and extreme mm. lows and it's all right to feel anything I think that's probably it. yeah it's that all right to real. feel anything that's probably yeah. the best advice I've heard yeah. that's yeah. probably yeah. it yeah. <laughs> it's all right to that's feel it. anything I, I, we've done advice that's <laughs> it <laughs> Yeah. We've nailed it. Well, I'm in. That's I think it. On that note, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. What an episode. Mm. I know. I, I, I always knew that when women get together who have been through a childbirth experience, they have the ability to talk for hours <laughs> about it. Correct. It's you know I, I say you know my my first experience is 12 years ago and it is like yesterday. So although you say you forget, you might forget the pain, but you don't forget the experience. Yeah. It's like such a so significant true. part mm. of who you become. Yeah, absolutely. In the future. What do you think your key takeaway was? Um, it's all right to feel anything. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. Did you I, say that? Uh, yeah, I think basically <laughs> I'm just going to quote myself. No, what is my key takeaway? Actually, it was. My key takeaway, I was thinking about um, how it's the complexity of emotions and feelings, both mm-hmm. in pregnancy through the act of uh, childbirth, whether that's um, a vaginal birth or C-section. Um, it, it's just an incredibly challenging period. There is so much change. There's um, a huge physical thing that's happening to you and a huge amount of physical change, hormonal change. And it's complicated and we're braced for some of it, but not for all of it. Mm. Um, And there are some bits that still are not spoken about enough. You know, we don't speak about maternal mental health enough. You know, we don't talk about those things. We don't talk about some of the tricky, icky things that happen to Mm. your body enough. And yet they are a universal experience for any woman in that situation. So I love these conversations because I think it 
opens the door, it normalizes, it allows people to relate. And that's why I love my NCT group as yeah, well. Yeah, 100%. Because we yeah. did share all of that uh, detail. So I don't know, what is my takeaway? Just that there is not one way. It's, yeah. it's just there really are so many different ways to experience this. Um, and it does go really fast. It does, doesn't yeah. it? I don't think I'll ever forget Shakira saying, um, enjoy the little things. Yeah, it it's got nice. me. I was did a bit you, like, oh, am, I, am I, am I going to cry? <laughs> um, because it is really hard and it's always the moments when, for me, when Amber is being challenging, yeah. when I'm like, this is Tantrum so time. annoying. Mm. Um, and then I'm like, oh, but she's only tiny. And then she flashes a smile and I'm like, okay, we're good again. <laughs> it's hard, it's perspective, isn't it? it? Is, it's just trying yeah. to find that. I do, I love the uh, focus on the small things or the small things are the things because um, I know I do this, thing where I stand back sometimes and watch my kids and I have a little like, mm, I don't know how to make that into words, but yeah. a little feeling. It's like at a wedding when they tell you if you're getting married, take five minutes to yourself yeah. and just take that five minutes to look around. Everyone in that room is there for you. Yeah. Taking that five minutes. It's been minutes present, to, isn't yeah, it, I suppose. to look and appreciate. I mean, you've got three. Three to appreciate. Three awesome humans who can also be really annoying. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Excellent. But there is, you know, it's a privilege. Well, Look, everyone has their own essentials for having a baby. Some are material, some are emotional. And for others, the essentials we take for granted, which is clean water, a decent toilet, somewhere to wash your hands, it's just not available. Mm. Water aids appeal, water means life, aims to bring clean water and hand washing facilities to healthcare centres around the world. And you can find out more and how to donate at wateraid.org. We will also be covering that on stylist.co.uk and on our stylist Instagram account. Um, that's all for this special bonus episode of Baby on the Brain, The Returners. Shakira Akabusi and Dr. Amelina Bakri have been our guests. And thank you so much yeah, from the bottom you. of my heart for taking part. Um, Baby on the Brain is back with the first episode from season two, which is all about returning to work. Um, available to stream and download this month. So like and subscribe and get updates from Stylist and Baby on the Brain. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. And thanks so much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. My name is Shakira Akabusi and I'm here today to work with WaterAid and Stylist Magazine to support Water Means Life Appeal. What was amazing was hearing issues discussed, the same issue discussed from different points of view and I could actually relate and understand to all of them. As a mum of four I've lived so many different experiences of that pregnancy and postnatal journey and this podcast really allowed us to highlight those important issues. I think what today really highlighted was how important sanitation and clean water is throughout life but particularly during labour during delivery and in that postpartum period and I cannot imagine not having access to that the thought of not having clean water during all of my deliveries is absolutely terrifying for me and my child particularly I'm thinking about the cesarean delivery and that whole process of that delivery and that postnatal recovery relied on sanitation and having access to clean water to be able to clean my hands and, and pick up my children. My name is Dr. Malina Bakri and I am a surgeon and a research fellow at Imperial College London and I have just recently become a mother and she's four months old and I'm here today to talk about maternal health and also the importance of clean water uh, with WaterAid. I'm very happy to be here today. I think from that podcast, um, one thing I would say the take home message for me is to appreciate little things that happens and don't think too much and don't overthink about you know trying to be prepared you just have to go with the flow and just enjoy um, pregnancy and motherhood and because you you will never get the the time back um, and when I go back to work um, I think I'll probably miss all those times you know spending time with her every day every morning um, going for walks and doing classes activities so I just want to appreciate that small little things um, as a doctor, I can't imagine um, you know, working without clean water because every day I use water um, to wash my hands, um, to, uh, to use it to, to clean surgical instruments, and I wash my hands every time I want to see a patient. So it is preventing you from having deadly diseases and preventing infections. 
I am shocked that one in four healthcare facilities around the world don't have access to clean water. So that's why I am supporting Water Rate, Water Means Life, so that everyone, everywhere, all the staff in, in the hospital healthcare facilities will be able to have access to clean water.